Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this week's uh, Sabbatical Live Summit presentation. Uh, starting again at, uh, at 12 midday that we're doing every week now, and um, I think we're up to episode 20 this week, uh, and we've got a really cool interview with, um, with one of our mates, uh, Joel Berg from All Yacht Spas, uh, all about rigging for cruising catamarans. Um, before we get into it, anyone that wants to watch these uh, can sign up from our website, multelcentral.com, uh, with future webinars, and also see the full replays and, uh, and, and re-listen via uh, YouTube and podcast uh, episodes audio wise as well. So welcome for all those attending. We've got a big one today and we want to get stuck into it. And um, Joel, are you there, mate? Uh, bring you in. Yep, I'm here. Hello, everybody. Excellent. Excellent. The technology is working. Um, <laughs> mate, thank you for joining us. You're up in uh, Brizzy uh, uh, headquarters up there for all the yacht spas. Yeah, mate. Sunny Brisbane. Weather's nice. Waters are closed, keeping the Mexicans out, unfortunately, but uh, things are nice. Things are nice. It's been actually a, a kind of a nice break to be a little more locked into the home state for a little while and not, not having to travel so much. So I'm enjoying it. Yeah, enjoy your backyard, which is pretty bloody good. So lucky you. Fortunately, spring is uh, is here in Sydney and we're really relishing getting back out on the water um, as quickly as possible. So um, before we get into it, I just want to, I guess, Give a little bit of background. So, um, all yacht spas uh, has been around how long now? Many. Uh, so the business originally opened up forty-two years ago. So, wow. um, my father and a couple of other partners started the business. Um, it's gone few through various iterations and a couple of different owners. But um, I guess my parents took over the business. I'm not so good with timelines anymore, but I'm going to say probably 20, maybe 25 years ago now, they took the whole thing over. Um, and then I moved into the business at that sort of time. And then they've sort of slid out over the last 10, 15 years. So, yeah, the business has been established for quite a while. And that's, you know, it's something we're quite proud of. There's not a lot of businesses that are doing A, manufacturing that hang around that long and B, manufacturing in a leisure industry like we do, you know, has its own challenges. So, um, yeah, we've got a, got our feet steadily on the ground and, um, yeah, we're happy to be here. Yeah, I think I first uh, met you and and, um, and your dad uh, back when you were involved with the, the Raider 34 and uh, yeah. took that over to the Miami Boat Show. It was a yes. odd place to, to meet, but um, and I was going back, what, 15 years maybe? Yeah. Uh, see, this is where I always get lost with time. Yeah, I think it would be all of that if we actually looked up the dates. Maybe but yeah, more. no, it was, it was quite a while ago. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, we were we were heavily involved with that that project, and we actually we we still have one of those boats ourselves. Or Dad does. He's he's retired now, so that's kind of one of the things to keep him out of our hair here in the factory. So he goes and plays on that. But yeah, yeah. it's been a, been a long standing relationship with you guys as well. Yeah, so uh, that, for those unfamiliar, the Raider 34 is a little Granger uh, high-performance racing cap, essentially, isn't it? I mean, a big, giant beast. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a, it's a little bit of a hybrid boat. It's sort of, it's it's not an inshore boat and it's not a full offshore boat. It, it's purely racing, but it's got a bit of compromise to suit both of those. And it does both of them quite well, but doesn't do either of those exceptionally. So, mm. Um, but you know, that's sort of, it's suited. It was a long way ahead of its time. And to think it's the design for that now is again, 20, 25 years old, been around a long time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great little toy. Yeah. But essentially you've had quite a bit of involvement in multi-holes and particularly racing multi-holes, I guess a long time now. Yeah. So, oh, well, yeah. Ever since I was a little kid, you know, I started off in the, the Sabos, which everybody does. Well, not everybody anymore, but you know, that, that was my upbringing in sailing. And then I went through the skiffs. Um, and then probably early teens, we, you know, or the business really started to focus in the multi-hulls. And a lot of that was involvement with Farrier and Ostac. And then when Corsair went to the US with Paul back in the day, um, we were heavily involved in, in that and the growth of that. Um, and that's sort of where it all started for us in multi-hulls. And, and we right. could see that the direction of the market was heading that way for obvious reasons. The boats make sense. Um, and yeah, we, we, there's no doubt we focused on it and it's been great for us. And we've gained a lot of, you know, got a lot of knowledge over that time because of that. 
Yeah. And I guess just to put that into context, so uh, Joel and all your spas provide uh, all the rigs for the, the current Corsair trimarans and also the Sea Wind catamarans built in Vietnam. So you guys essentially do all the extrusions and all the componentry, box them up in some containers and send them to Vietnam and then they're assembled over there. Yeah, basically, yeah, they do all the assembly work over there. Um, it's good because it gives a lot of the guys over there a bit of an insight as to, you know, the, the final piece of the puzzle for the boat. They obviously see the boat from its from the initial layup all the way through to sea trial quite often. Um, and, yeah, it's good. It, it works well for us because we still build all the, the components that are engineered um, and they kind of fabricate, uh, sorry, assemble it. So put it together like a big jigsaw puzzle and... Um, then ship the boats wherever they go. Ironically, half of them still come back here, thanks to you, but um, yeah. Well, and, and ironically, you put the rigs back together to, put them, to step them onto the boat <laughs> when they arrive in Brisbane, of which quite a few, uh, quite a few of them do. So yeah, the, the yeah. circle's complete. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess just to put that into context, because we've got, a, a, I think, a really uh, important talk today uh, for anyone either about to buy a cruising catamaran, certainly used catamaran, and for anyone who owns catamaran that's um, that they've had it for a few years, I guess, and uh, certainly preparing to do any blue water cruising that might put any sort of stress on the rig, or um, it's getting a few years onto it and um, maybe getting uh, nudges from insurance companies to, to get rig checks and things done. And so we want to dive into, I guess, what the importance of a rig check is and what you guys actually do and what you're looking for. And, and I guess the, the important um, things to be mindful of on a rig that uh, could ultimately um, give way and, and cause havoc when you really don't want it somewhere out in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. So, um, so and I've given a little bit of it away there, but why why bother get a rig check and, and who should get a rig check? Yeah, look, I mean, to us, it seems very obvious, you know, really everybody should be getting their rig check. Um, a boat is very different to a motor car, but the same sort of principles apply. I mean, you don't just drive your motor car forever without checking your oil and making sure your tyres are right. Um, so from that point of view, we sort of, that's, that's, that's how we discuss it with clients really is a, a boat is, it has a lot more working parts. You go to remote places where you quite often can't get things serviced. You know, the boats that we're dealing with are, as you say, they're blue water cruising boats, most of them. Um, people we deal with are really buying their dream to sail off into the sunset, go cruising. A, a lot of people we deal with are retired, obviously. Um, and yeah, the last thing you want is to have problems at sea. We all know about what Mother Nature can, can dish us out. So it's basically just about making sure that your boat's prepared um, as well as it can be. The rigs are quite complex in their, in their design and engineering behind it. From a inspection point of view, they're, they're quite simple if you know what you're looking for because there's only so much that we can look at visually to tell whether there's going to be issues or whether there is issues. Um, and so, yeah, it's something that we recommend to our owners annually. Um, admittedly, not a huge amount of people do that, um, you know, for various reasons, but we recommend it to do it annually. Simply a lot of it's got to do with the environment the things are in. It is one of the worst environments, you know, being in the sun, the salt, the sea air, um, even just sitting at a marina berth with electricity around, all of those things have effects on all of the systems on the rig. So it's quite important to get that looked at. Uh, every year, we, as I say, every year we recommend it. It's a relatively small cost in the ownership of a boat. Um, insurance companies are pushing more and more for riggers to be doing this for clients, to, for protection for them as well. Um, you know, they are a business. They don't want things breaking. We're the same. We don't want things breaking. Um, and it's easier to pick up something early than leaving it until last minute and potentially having a failure. Yeah, certainly on, uh, I think, beyond well, 10 years and onwards, 
I think most insurance companies will require a rig check every year for the, the rigger to sign off on it, um, sometimes earlier. Yeah, so we, um, our company stance, and a lot of this is driven by insurance and by manufacturers' recommendations, um, is at 10 years, we generally won't sign ringing off. We would right. still sign off the mast itself and fittings if we're happy with them. But at 10 years, we really recommend that your rigging gets replaced. Um, and that's, it's a difficult one because we do have a lot of clients who have been sailing around with old gal wire for 30, 40 years, never had an issue. Um, you know, and the talk around like a lot of people, you know, what the boating is a very social event. So a lot of people talk, they get a lot of information from a lot of different parties. Um, and a lot of that quite often is conflicting. So where we're coming from is really we work off what we see. You know, we do we do rebuilds for, for rigs that have broken. Obviously, we do a lot of insurance work and we do our new work. So um, history is telling us that around 10 years, that's when you're more likely to start seeing fatigue issues and failures. Again, mainly in cables, unless there's other things that we can spot. But um, yeah, at 10 years, we, we will not sign off rigging. Um, and generally, that's why we say, you know, a, a, a yacht mast should be should last you an awfully long time. The rigging and the running rigging are the two things that really need to be replaced. Not often your running rigging will fail, no doubt, before your your standing rigging. But the standing rigging, just simply because of the fatigue on it, and again the environment that it's in, um, that's why we recommend around ten years that it gets replaced. Yeah. So let's dive into what you guys are looking for in a rig check. Let's let's look at a boat that's less than ten years as an example. Um, yep. You know what what are you actually looking for, and where are the weak points in a in a typical uh, stainless style rig? Yeah. So generally, the piece of wire that we can see, as in between the two state between the two swage fittings or or swage list fittings. Um, we generally don't see any issues with that. And quite often these days, we can't even inspect that because they have plastic coatings on them, loose plastic coatings. Um, so where we're really focusing on is the structural point. So where your diamonds come into the mast, the spreader ends, um, your four-stay attachment, your cap out attachments. And through various manufacturers, there's a whole variety of different ways those things can be assembled. So we're looking at it's not the same fitting on every boat. Um, some people weld them. Some, some people just bolt them in. Um, the example you're showing there, that's a European mask with a plastic spreader tip. Now, that's something that we would recommend a replacement on. We wouldn't, we wouldn't deem that there's a huge issue with that, but it's something that needs to be fixed in the next 12 months simply because that wire is about to be bearing on alloy. Um, and yeah, we're going to come up with corrosion issues in there. So those sorts of points, mainly around the structural rigging on the boat is what we focus very heavily on. That's the main points where we see failures in long term. Um, yeah, we've got, got a whole bunch of examples here that you've given us of some photos. So, uh, so we've got a... Yeah, so this that we can see here, um, you know, we've got a rigging screw and we can see a hairline crack through it now. Um, we don't see these too often, but, you know, they are something and they can be very difficult to pick up in different fittings. This is quite a clean fitting. Quite often they're, they're not like that. So it's very difficult to tell a, the difference between a casting floor and a crack. So, but these are the sorts of things that we need to bring up. And if further inspections warranted, then quite often they'll need to be pulled apart and um, gone further. So, yeah. yeah. And then I think we've got a... Um... What's this a stay? Yep. So this is just as you can see the lay of the wire changes. So something that's actually a swageless fitting. So that's not a crimped on fitting. So there's something going on in that swageless area under that body um, that's not right. So you know the potential there is that if that was loaded, you know it, it could potentially fail, and then obviously you lose your rig. So. Um, that is quite a common thing. We see quite a lot of splaying of wires, uh, what we call bird caging of wire, where you can get halyards wrapped around wires, particularly on four stays. 
and the wires actually sort of spread open a little bit. Um, and that again, because you're doing that close to fittings, you get point loading on the stranding of the wire. Um, it's not, not what the wire's made to deal with. Yeah, I think we've got a, um, an image here of a Birkage uh, example or similar to it. Is that right? Um, it's a uh, bore saber the looks of it. Yeah, so yeah. that's one that's done the bird cage, and then that that I'm speaking a little bit out of school because I don't recall the exact job, but I would dare say that those two strands that you can see are actually broken up at the swage. Right. Um, and that's you know that's something that like that one is quite obvious, but they're not always as obvious as that to look for. So it it does take you know a lot of the things are very simple, and we we sort of push owners to get familiar with their rig, you know, like anything, get familiar with it, go up, check over things, have a look at what you see and then keep an eye out for differences. You know, if you see something changing, you know, technology makes so, so easy these days, quite often we're getting photos of things that people want us just to check over. And we can't always definitively say off the photo, yes, that's fine. Um, but yeah, it is um, it's something that, we can assist with clients. Yeah, and I guess that's the point, isn't it? That uh, to get up there yourself a little bit and make yourself familiar with uh, what's going on up top, because a lot of the stuff's out of sight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and as I say, I mean, insurance companies won't accept that an owner's checked their rig, so they still need to involve people like us. But it's it's that first stop. I mean, they're the people who are on the boats all the time. They, they can check it at their own cost. doesn't cost anything to go up and down a mast. Um, you know, it, it's something that, that's a really good practice. I mean, I do the same on my car. I walk around and look at my tyres, you know. So I know if my tyres need replacing, there's, there's no reason that owners can't get involved just as an initial check. And it's a, to me, it's a really good habit. There's a lot of moving parts, lots of little fasteners, lots of bits and pieces that you know, can rattle loose. I don't know if many of our listeners today have ever been up a mast when the boat's at sea or in motion, um, but it's a pretty violent ride up there. You know, it's certainly nothing like being on the deck of a boat. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you go up and experience that, it gives you some idea of the, the stresses that things are going through. You know, even on a pleasant day, things are moving and shaking and vibrating. And um, yeah, it, it's easy to pick those things up if you know what should be there. So if you put on the bosun's chair, head up the rig as, as a boat owner, uh, what are the common sort of weak points or things that you should be looking out for as, a, as, a, as an owner? Well, again, I mean, the really obvious ones is all we would recommend they look at. You know, like, is there any broken strands of wire? Is there any lay of the wire that's not sitting right? Is there any cracking around the structural fitting? So where your diamonds come into your mast and terminate, all your spreader routes. And I think we have got an example there of a, a very obvious spreader failure. Um, you know, fasteners that hold pins in for sheaves, those sorts of things. Now, they're not going to create big structural issues, but they're things that can be a real problem for you if you're out at sea. Yeah, so let's just go through some of the... Um, so I think we've got a diamond... Here, a spreader. Sorry. Yeah, so this is a spreader route. Now, this is a fairly common way that, um, you know, and I'm not picking on Europeans, but this is a common way that Europeans do their spreader route. So they actually have a bar that runs through a large hole in the mast, and then the spreader is connected to that bar. Now, again, because of the, the motions in a mast, they move around quite a lot. And, and a spreader point is one when they are moving around fore and aft in particular that area cops a lot of punishment, really. So what we're seeing here is we're just seeing fatigue over time where that the mast has really been shaking backwards and forwards and vibrating or, or pumping in significant cases, and we're starting to see cracking around that route. Now, I wouldn't say that mast is about to fail, you, fail sorry, but it's not something that we would leave. You know, it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, can't say how it is. And I think... Uh... We've got another one here of an actual failed. Yes. So again, this is pretty unusual. We don't see a lot of this. Um, but this, the way this spreader actually works is there's a plate that goes into the spreader extrusion itself. 
and that spreader has failed at the end of that plate. Quite often this can happen from something getting stuck around the tip of the spreader and pulling it back. Um, it's not often we see that, but that's an obvious one. You know, the other thing that we do see fairly often is cracking around all of those welds that you can see there. That's something that is very simple to see. Yeah, and it is, we see that quite common. And if you see that sort of cracking, that is time for replacement, no doubt. Absolutely. Section. Yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing you would never sail with. That's something where you need to limp home or, you know, get straight on to, to a professional that's something that needs to be remedied. Because, I mean, the, the, the diamonds and the spreaders are obviously key parts of keeping that rig um, a strong and structural unit, right? Absolutely, yeah. So we do hear quite often, oh, you know, the rigs are over-rigged, but, you know, with the engineering that goes into them, every piece of wire on a rig is generally it's there for a purpose. So you, most rigs are not built with too many redundancies. They have safety margins, but they're not built with wires that are, are not really designed to be there. There's not wires that are designed there as a backup. Um, they all have a purpose in the design of the mast. So that's why it is so critical, no matter how small the bits and pieces are of damage that you see, that it gets brought to someone's attention. Um, a few other little examples here you've given us. Uh, so this is pretty minor. You need a decent eye to be running over these. Um, and obviously some damage to the state. Yeah, so look, I couldn't, I couldn't say what's caused that. Um, we do deal with a lot of boats that have seen lightning strikes. So it's potentially something like that. Um, but yeah, this is why, you know, as I say, a lot of things that we would say to an owner to go and look at, they, you know, we wouldn't expect they would pick things up like this. This is why it's important still to get people who are doing it day in, day out to look over these things for you. Um, so, you know, we do quite often and, and the things are quite simple. If you run your hands up a wire, you will feel, you know, little little bits of porosity or changes in the, in the wire. We can only see the outer strands of the wire. We can't see the inner strands of the wire. Um, so that's all we can work on. But yeah, you can do a lot of it by feel as well, as silly as it sounds, and then inspect further if you feel something unusual. Um, yeah, again, this is a pretty obvious issue, the, the toggle on a forestay, and I'm fairly certain that this is on a rotating rig. I could be wrong. We see a couple of rotating rigs designed like this, a little bit odd. Um, but yeah, somehow, and I don't know how that toggle's been bent. So there's been something that's caught it or it's rotated funny and yeah, damaged the toggle. And obviously they're not designed to be sitting like that. So that, that sort of thing would need to be dealt with. Yeah, some of the attachments to the mast, I think we've got an image here. Um, I mean, this stuff would be less visible if you've got a shackle or something going through it at the time. So you need a, a pretty close inspection. Yeah, and, and these are the things like, you know, that that we look for because we do it day in, day out. So when we do an inspection, it's it's quite thorough. It takes us a couple of hours. Um, generally, we've obviously got two guys on site because there is various safety issues with, you know, working with people who we, we, don't, we don't work with day in, day out. So, and that also gives the guy sitting up the mask, you know, he's comfortable with, who, with his workmate who he works with day in, day out because essentially he's got his life in his hands. So... The guy who's doing the inspection, you know, he's got to be comfortable up there because it is, you really need to concentrate on, on the detail. And the photos actually show things a lot more obviously than what they would actually look like in life, in real life viewing. them. So, um, yeah, cracks like that would be quite difficult to see. But you know, we, we generally know where the load points are and we know what to look for. So we give those, things, those parts a little bit of extra attention. And you are saying before that... Um... You know, with the stays, obviously you've got your outer stays and inner stays. Uh, what can you do about potential inner stay um, damage or corrosion? Well, look, unfortunately, there is really nothing you can do. We, we can't view it. Um, mm. You may see a lot of rust coming out of fittings, which, which is potentially a good sign. Or, well, it's not a good sign, but a sign that there is something going on that needs to be looked at further. Um, but to be honest, generally by that stage, it can be too late anyway. And even if we see that, 
we still can't actually tell if if there's a lot of damage on the inside. But the reality of it is that if you see rust streaking out of something, you know, it, it's probably not right. Depends how much. There's lots of things that are taken into account when we would make those calls. Um, but yeah, there's there's no way you can service. There's no way you can peel apart the wire to see. So, you know, it's something that if anybody ever sees it, they really need to. Again, you can start with a simple photo. Take a photo of it, send it to someone like us, and we can look over it and give a suggestion whether we'd need to come and have a look or no. Look, it's nothing to be concerned about because. Everybody also has their own opinion of what they think is going to be acceptable and not acceptable. And that's owners, you know, like I, I treat my car differently to the way my neighbor does and the way you will. So, you know, everybody looks at things differently. So never be shy to ask, you know, there's, there's plenty of people around, plenty of it, plenty of people who do what we do that will be more than willing to, uh, to help out. Mm. So once a rig check's been done, I mean, and a rig is signed off on it. You should have some confidence, though, that uh, that that's good to go, good to go to see. Because generally, a rigger, I assume, are uh, not going to sign off on anything that um, they've got any concerns about. Because there's obviously some liability there. Yeah. Look, absolutely. Um, again, not speaking out of school, but I know we are quite pedantic with, with what we will and won't sign off. Um, and we have had people who don't accept that we won't sign things off and they've gone and found riggers who will do it. So even riggers have varying ideas of what's acceptable and what's not. But for us, you know, again, we've been established a long time um, and, and we, we believe that what we're doing is right in, in the benefit of everybody, you know, in the benefit of keeping our business operating at the professional level we want to. And making sure that our clients can, if they want, sail around the world. That's essentially what, you know, that's the market we're dealing with. So if someone's going to be be on a passage for, you know, two weeks, three weeks, we want to make sure that what we're looking at is going to, to, to do that for them. So, yeah, it, you know, I'm not saying everybody needs to come to us, but I know that we are more pedantic than, than some people out there. Um, yeah, yeah. But you know, whether or not when we... When we say that we won't sign something off, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to fail straight away either because, as I say, we can't definitively say unless there's broken strands there that, you know, that's going to fail you on, to, fail you, fail on you. Um, but in our mind, it's something that needs to be actioned. So that's sort of where it comes from. Sure, sure. And once you've done your rig, you, you're comfortable and you're, you're good to go um, and you're out, say in the middle of the Pacific there, what about um, preventative maintenance? Is there any sort of preventative maintenance a, um, a boat owner can do to help protect their rig? Or is it really just keeping an eye on it? Yeah, look, really keeping an eye on it. That, that's about it. I mean, there's nothing you can really service on the, on the structural side of things. You know, like you can put grease on things, but you can't go and undo your turnbuckles while at sea and grease them. And that's really just... That, that just makes the rigger's job easier anyway when he's going to pull the rig apart again. It doesn't necessarily give the rigging more life. So the way the rigs are going, the way the rigs are designed, it's very much they're designed so that once they're in the boat and they're set up and they're tuned right, they should be okay to sail. Um, the big grey area around all of that is how people sail their boats. And that's one that's that's really a whole nother conversation. But again, it's, it's not that common that rigs are designed that people can go and fly holes on, you know, for example, a, a Seawind 1260. Um, now, off memory, they are actually designed at about 100% of RM those, but it, it, it's, there's, a, there's a balancing act between designing something that's stupidly oversized so that people can go and sail it however they want and something that's, you know, reasonable for the boat with certain limitations. So as I say, it would be very unusual for a 1260 owner to sail around at full riding moment, which is essentially boat loaded with full fuel, full water, supplies, people, and then go and fly a hull. That, that's really not what the, the boat is designed for either. So that's sort of the complexities with, you know, when you say what can they do on a passage, the biggest thing is to sail the boat sensibly and, you know, yeah, just don't 
don't sail at flying hulls and doing silly things like that. With with the market, that's not the market that it's dealing with. Well, that, what you touch on a really good and important point. Uh, and I just want to say, any C1260 owners out there, please don't try and fly a hull. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you guys were heavily involved, I believe, with the rig design for the 1260. Um so what, what uh, you know, is it, is it designed to that point or would you expect to see the rig go before you even got to that point? Um, look, again, there's a lot of different factors that come into account. So when we say, you know, when it's designed to whatever RM now, just to be clear on that, there's actually an external company that did the engineering on the sure. Seawinds. Um, but Generally, obviously, we will design to a percentage of a riding moment and then there's a safety margin applied. So if you're sailing around, if if the rig is designed to handle full riding moment, then theoretically, yes, you can go and, you know, sail around and go and do that. But I reckon I could count on two hands how many boats are actually designed like that. We're talking much more high-performance boats. Um when you get into into larger cruising boats, the, the the percentage of the riding moment is generally lowered a little bit because they're not sailed to that. Um, now, and that's where the grey area is because that doesn't necessarily mean that the rig wouldn't handle it, but it's not it's not really what it's designed for. So essentially, what you're doing is you're eating into margin anywhere if you go and start doing those things, and you add seaways into it, and you're already the shock loads that are going through everything and the way the rigs are behaving and starting to move around and the columns are changing. Um, that's, you know, that's all reducing safety margin and everything. So yeah, that it, it's obviously, it's not a good thing to be doing for those. They're not, they, they're not designed for it. Doesn't necessarily mean that the rig's going to blow out of the boat, but yeah, don't go trying flying your holes on your 1260s. You're pushing it. No, <laughs> no. And I mean, I, I must say we, we always, because we never actually had, the sea wind to go over and it was always expected that the rig would probably go before the boat did because it is you know they're pretty they're light in uh relative terms but there's still a, you know eight or nine ton at least of boat to uh be you know pulling up out of the water so it's a huge amount of pressure obviously on the rig to start getting to those points right yeah and that's the thing with with multi hulls it's obviously very different to mono hulls um, multi holes rather than lean over the, the power goes basically straight through the rig and into the boat itself mm. um, which which puts a massive amount of force into the rigs and the rigging and that's why we're so focused on the structure in them and the margins that we're pushing through and that's again why when we're doing inspections we really focus on those high load points because the loads on a 40 foot multi hull are significantly more than a 40 foot multi hull, uh, mono hull. Sorry, I can't give you the exact percentage because every boat is different. Um, but yeah, rather than transferring the power, you know, into the, the moment of the keel, it's transferred into trying to pick an eight ton boat up. And, you know, it takes a lot of pressure to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. We've got some questions coming through. David, g'day, David. Um, mentioned uh, he's from the aviation background, lots of redundancy built into systems, obviously. Uh, boats don't, well, rigs don't have, uh, we, I think you mentioned earlier, boats don't have that much redundancy built in. But what you're essentially saying is the redundancy is built into the margin and the engineering of the rig itself, as opposed to secondary and third failure uh, redundancies. Yeah, absolutely. So, and look, yeah, different industries definitely handle it different ways. And, you know, um, yeah, generally, though, when we're designing a rig, we're not building redundancies into wires. Absolutely. We can't put an extra set of stays on. And it's a lot of it's simply to do with the way the column is working. Um, you know, you've got a set of cap shrouds. We can't put another set of cap shrouds 500 mil down that are going to essentially, you know, back the other one up because if the, the main one breaks then you've also your column changes so you know you could you'd have to put a bigger column in and it, it's just there's lots of things that need to be taken into account with it the pitching moment of the boat changes with bigger tubes and so yeah it's it, generally it yeah well it's only done in the margin yes 
Um, when you go about tuning a rig, what should be considered? I mean, obviously, there's a bit of stretch that happens in new boats. We often, well, we generally get rigs um, tuned shortly after they've uh, been, been stepped on a new boat. Um, but how often would you actually need to tune a rig? Um, yeah, look, that's a difficult one again because a lot of that does come into how much margin's built into everything as to how much everything's going to be stressed. Hmm. Um, but we but as far as a stainless rig goes on a cruising boat, is it something you need to worry about? Or once it's found its setting, it's set and forget? Yeah, that very much. That they are very much like that. I mean, it, again, it's something that um, we do recommend owners keep an eye on. You know, but it's not something that you should have to get tuned every six or 12 months. Really, quite often, once they go in the boat, we don't hear from our owners for another, you know, five years generally. Um, and they do very little along the way. We give a very loose sort of recommendation as to possibly what they can do on their main shrouds, um, which is just so that the lured side is not flopping around too much. So we sort of talk through that. At, but again, every boat will handle the rig a different way. Every boat's slightly differently built. The structure in them's different. So every boat behaves differently and therefore the rig is set up differently. Well, you touch on a good point here and uh, Greg actually sent through an earlier question um, regarding the leeward sh shroud. Uh, and he's got here, you know, how much play should there be in the leeward sh shroud uh, with a good wind of say 20 knots? Um, forward to the beam uh, to keep it a stable rig. I mean, you do see that a bit, a bit of slop working into the leeward shroud when you've got a bit of pressure into it. Where does that become a concern? And uh, how do you sort of work that out? Well, look, and, and that's, it, it is very complex. And a lot of it's done by, you know, experience. Um, because as I say, every boat is going to be different. Mm. You know, like it, even in, in the sea wind range, the 1260 will move differently to the 1160. So exactly where what boat's going to set up is something that's really done through experience. Um, we would say though, if you have in the vicinity of sort of, you know, three to 400 mil, then you should be getting someone to check it. You know, if, it, if it's to that extent, then someone should come and look at it for you and make sure that everything is, is set correctly. And what about Dyneema rigs? I mean, um, from my experience, they do have a little bit more creep in them. Um, yeah. Are there special considerations for Dyneema? Or synthetic? Oh, there, can you hear that noise? Sorry. I'll we can, but no, it, it adds to, me. to the effect. Um, yeah. If you give me two seconds, I'll go and tell them to be quiet if you'd like. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Just bear with me. Sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> And while we're waiting, we'll bring up some more images of uh, our presentation here. Not that I can give too much commentary, but, uh, and please, uh, we are getting questions through, so uh, great to, um, I'll present those, particularly at, towards the end of the presentation if we haven't done so already. I think we've got a, uh, a forced a uh, sleeve here for the furling jib with the grub screws missing. We might ask him about that shortly. Yeah, I'm yeah. Back. He's back, he's back. All right, I was, I was doing my best to- People uh, drilling holes in my building, sorry. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, sorry, so where were we exactly? Dyneema so just Well, Dyneema, um, partly around, I guess, the, from my experience, they, they, on bigger boats, they tend to creep a little bit more. Um, yeah. They stretch a little bit more. So, look, personally, I'm not a big fan of Dyneema rigging on, on larger projects. Um, and simply because of what we were just talking about with the tuning of the rig, a lot of our clients don't want to have to tune. They, they basically very much want us to set the boat up, maybe look at it once and then kind of forget about it for a while with, you know, keeping an eye on it, but not have to, you know, continually tighten things until stretch is taken out of it. Now, Dyneema has been used in rigging for a fair while now. Um, the thing that we find with it is, yeah, it just, it takes a little more to get the stretch out of it. And therefore it takes an owner 
who's willing to get somebody involved to do that for them. Um, you know, we've heard of insurance issues with it. We haven't come across any, haven't seen really any of it break. It's really that stretch and the initial setup that scares most of our clients away from it. Um, personally, when it comes to, you know, rather than talking about Dyneema, but talking about synthetic rigging, mm. We will generally recommend to go down the path of a PBO or an Aramid or something like that. And the big difference in those cables is they're a straight cable. So you, you look at a, a rope and it's all woven. So the way that we believe, well, the, the rigging that we prefer is when the, the rope strand is straight. So that way you don't have that sort of creep of the weave growing or closing in on itself and splicing that sort of thing. So. That's where most of your most of your growth is coming from. Um, I think that look, the product has a place. I think in smaller boats, it's not an issue because most of those people they were a little more of a day boat and they're happy to play with things like that. But look, for me, yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it for big round the world cruising boats unless people are have an understanding of the issues. Isn't the right word, but you know some of the things that go along with it that make it just not quite as simple as stainless steel. Mm, mm. And we had a question come in from Paul uh, earlier there about um, what would stop you from replacing a stainless rig with a synthetic rig, including diamonds uh, and front cross beam support and hull stays. Yeah, well, look, again, it depends. On, I, mean, I mean, from my company's point of view, it would depend on the type of rigging that the client wanted to use. Um, there's no reason you can't do it. The fittings are not generally directly interchangeable. You know, you've got, if you're to go from something, you know, again, using a sea wind as a reference, all the fittings are, you know, they're tailor-made. It's, it's fairly simple stuff to get off the shelf. If, you, if we were to put synthetic on that, there's a couple of other complexities. Things get a bit bigger and bulkier and, um, yeah, you, you can get pre-stretched Dyneema that, you know, there's a couple of people around who sell it, but we don't actively market it. We try and stay away from it just because of those issues. As I say, we're dealing very much to our market and our market people, that's not, we, we get occasionally people looking for it, but most people are not. Um, can be done, no doubt, but you've got to be aware that, yeah, you're going to need to deal with that stretch and those sorts of things along the way. Um, if you're happy to deal with that, then... Yeah, I guess as long as your insurance company will accept it, which we're still not really sure where that's going at the moment. Um, yeah, then I guess there's no real reason that people can't go that way. So, I mean, as a rigger, and you're obviously a very experienced um, multi hull sailor, if you were setting yourself up on a, on a cruising boat, uh, would you be going down the carbon synthetic rigging option on a you know, semi-performance cruising cat or would you be satisfied with stainless and uh, aluminium Look, for me personally and, and this brutally honest i would stick with aluminium and stainless just because of its simplicity mm. you know it is it is very simple product it's very well known um sure it has a bit more weight but the reality of it is on, on the grand scheme of the weight of a boat it's 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 not huge now no doubt you're going to get a bit more performance and your boat is going to behave a bit differently if you put a carbon rig and, you know, PBO or Aramid rigging on it, those sorts of things. Um, but for me, I've raced nearly my whole life. When I do hop on a cruising boat, I very much want to sit down and, you know, have a red wine and relax. I'm not really worried about those little bits and pieces. You know, I've, I've I always think that if you to sail off into the sunset somewhere, you know, I would want something that's very simple, easy to get in remote places, things. Admittedly, the world's getting smaller these days or pre-COVID it was, you know, it was a lot easier to get things around the world. So maybe that's not such an argument anymore, but I just like the simplicity of, of aluminium and stainless and, and the ability, I guess, for me, I, I could fix it, you know, like I'm a, I'm a bit hands-on, Whereas composites, I'm not so much. It's it's not what I deal with, so it doesn't scare me. But it's not something that you know. If something happened, I would I, I would probably struggle to come up with a fix as quickly and as probably as good as I could with alloy. Um, 
lots of the things in alloy, some of even the photos that we've shown are repairable. You know, it's not like you've got to throw your whole mast away. Composite's very much the same, but I think it's that next element of, you know, it's, there's a lot more specialists in it because it is such a complex product in the way that it's, again, designed, engineered, built. It's, it's the next level again on top of alloy by a long way. So for me, I'd be keeping it basic, but you know, that's just my own personal opinion. Mm. I know that yeah. doesn't suit everybody. It's it's good to get opinions. Uh, that's what you're here for, mate. So uh, appreciate that. Um, so I'm just gonna we're gonna go to some questions here. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming through. I'm gonna try and get through most of them here. Um, uh, so yeah, when when tuning a rig, I mean a, a rigger is the ideal person to turn to for tuning. I guess any sort of rig, uh, as opposed to a, I know a sail maker or general sail. Well, look again in the in the ideal world, a rigger and a sail maker will work together, mm. um, particularly know, to get performance out of your sails, right? Because there is a lot of um, symbiosis between the sails and the rig. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, but we are starting to talk sort of micro, micro advantages in doing that. Again, we're looking in, in what we're looking for is we're just looking to make sure that the product, as in the mast and the rigging, goes on the boat and it's safe and it's tuned so that it is safe. If you want to go to that next step, it's where you need to get your sailmakers involved. Now, there's no doubt. Again, there's there's sailmakers around who have been in the industry a long time um, who could probably go out and do it whether or not they want to and have the insurances to, and, you know, there's no doubt they could do it, but um, yeah, in the big scheme of things with insurances and liabilities, look, I, I couldn't answer whether or not they could do it from that point of view, but there's no doubt technically plenty of them could. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we've got a question here from Peter. Uh, G'day Peter he had a mismatch between the bottom of the mass socket and the step mast, uh, which are 10 years old, were nearly completely worn out and close to failure, but a rigger picked it up. How often do you see that type of issue? Um, I'm assuming this is around the mast foot area where the mast is chewed out on the heel or there's just dissimilar metals or something. Yeah, mismatch between yeah. the bottom of the mast socket and the mast step. Oh, okay. Well, look, there's a couple of things that we do see. So one is the dissimilar metals. The other is where the mast hasn't sat on the trim perfectly. So there's a couple of different ways of building a mast base. One is where the mast base is just bolted directly to the deck or a compression post or something along those lines. And then the mast in the factory is trimmed to suit whatever the design rake is. So essentially when the mast goes on, the whole bottom of the extrusion should touch on that mass base. Um, quite often it's not. We do see that it's not. Sometimes we would allow it. It just depends how bad it is. Because what you're essentially doing, obviously, is you're point loading different areas on the extrusion. Now, we do see nearly, I'd say, probably 90% of masks that we pull out after a significant amount of time the bottom of the mast is always a little bit worn. Now that's not unusual and it's generally not an issue. We have seen oh, a few extreme cases where, yeah, the, the, the mast has been so badly trimmed. And what happens again is as the sail forces come on, the mast can actually twist backwards and forwards on the heel. And that essentially the whole thing just kind of clunks around and grinds itself to pieces. So yeah, it, it is something that we can see, but the biggest thing that you will see to pick it up is gaps around them, around between the extrusion and the heel. Um, as I say, some of those gaps are acceptable. It just depends how big they are because we do allow for a little bit of movement. On bigger rigs, what we actually do is we build what we call a rocker plate, which is where there's a plate bolted on the deck and it's got a vertical tongue on it. And then the, the heel that sits in the bottom of the mask goes down over that tongue and it has a curve built in the bottom of, of the heel. And that essentially just allows the mask to find its own position. Um, we do that on bigger ones just simply because the forces are a lot bigger and it just allows everything to settle where it wants to settle. We don't do it that often on really probably... Uh, generally on our section sizes, we change it. So we would generally start it on our section that's about 284 and a half. Under that, we do it occasionally, but not often. 
it's more in consul consultation with the owner whether they want the flexibility to move things and do that sort of thing so mm. yeah mm. Okay, excellent. Uh, I had a question here from Terence. Storm jibs, rig set up. Is it better to set up on a baby stay? I think they're generally set up on baby stays or an inner stay. Yeah, look, again, it, it depends on the original design of the rig. Mm. Um, if, if I was to do my own boat, I would have a separate, completely separate inner four stay, lower down the mast, but then you really need a, a, a stay to the boat opposing that. It, you can do it with diamonds, but it's asking a lot of the diamonds. So it's something that would need to be done or looked at very carefully if it was an addition. Otherwise, it, I mean, if it was designed in from the outset, you could design everything big enough to handle it. But if it's not, you can overload other areas of the mast that aren't designed for it. Um, so, yeah, ideally, though, if you could get an inner four stay and a set of intermediates or lowers off that, you're essentially creating a, a whole nother stay point so you've got your main caps and four stay, and then you're essentially creating that again further down. Um, and that can give you a really stable rig in extreme conditions. Excellent. Uh, I've got a question here from Nick. What generally is the extra cost of a synthetic style rigging compared to stainless? Is it a big jump up or what? Look, in, in, again, it depends what synthetic you're talking. If you're looking at Dyneema, um, no, it's not a huge cost. The, the cost difference, look, we don't price it very often. I could count on one hand, I reckon, how many times we've actually put it through this place. So, right. um, but I know I know the rope that's used and I know the cost of that and I know the price of splicing. So the product itself, no, there would be very little difference in until you go to like a straight laid cable, then you're going to add on, you're going to be probably another 100% on the rigging at least. Wow. So it gets quite expensive. A uh, question here from Daniel. Does titanium fittings hold up better than stainless steel or aluminium? Do you touch titanium? We don't touch it, no. And, and simply because of the expense. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I have no authority to speak on it, to be honest. Um, mm. it, all I do know is that it's too expensive for, for really the market we're dealing with. I know in the higher end stuff, they do use it, but it's more a weight thing then. Yeah. And what about... Um, Anti seas uh, lubricants versus grease, and what are you using in the? Um, uh, we use Tef gel. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we don't really use grease or anti seas products anywhere. Um, Tef gel is an anti corrosive product, and it therefore it does stop things seizing up. But that's that's our product of choice. We've used Duralac for years as well. So those two are really the two we use. Um, we stick away from, from grease. Um, we've just never really never, never really looked at that option. Tef gel is a product that's designed to do exactly what we want it to do. So that's what we're using. Yep, yep. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Terence. Terry, I think it is. Hey, Terry, um, what size boat, even with swept back spreaders, would go for a running backstay for long cruising? Um, look, it, again, it depends on how far the spreaders are swept back. If, if, there's, if we're talking a monohull here, which generally... Sounds like it. Yeah, generally a monohull. Yeah. It's, um, you know, 25 degrees plus, you, you, you shouldn't need runners. They, they're only there then to get a little bit more forced day tension, but... Apart from that, you just shouldn't need them. And a lot of people obviously don't want them, so there's no need to put them on. Um, I guess from a, you know, talking about redundancies earlier, that would probably deload your cap shrouds and that sort of thing a little bit. So you might get some added safety there, but um, yeah, it's not something that we've really ever looked at doing. Here's a good question. Um... We've had someone ask your thoughts on furling mainsails with regards to the yep. rig. What's yeah. your opinion on that on a uh, on a on a cat? I've um, got my look, opinion, I'll, but I'll, I'll I'll let you yeah. look. The furling booms are a lot better these days than than they have been. We've fitted quite a few now. Um, I, I'm certainly not against them. The, the The reason we don't do more of them is generally just the cost of them. You know that most people can't 
can't see the value in the extra expense. Um, the sales are not so bad. Once they're set up and working, they're, they're not too bad. But what we do tell people is there's a lot more potential for problems than your other reefing methods. So if you're happy to wear that, and again, looking at the people we're dealing with who are sailing off into the sunset, most people don't want, you know, they want to limit any potential problems anywhere they can. So, yeah, you know, that, that's probably the reason we're not selling them that and cost. So personally, I'm not against them, but I wouldn't have one on my own boat just for that reason. There's lots of moving parts. You've got to make sure your boom set right. You know, you can't just drop your sails. They're on a bolt rope. Um, you know, those things to me are not ideal if you're cruising. And generally, most people will be cruising shorthanded. Um, so, you know, you want systems that when they're, when you want them to work, they're going to work for you. So quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good answer. Uh, I've got a question here from Paul. Stainless is known for surprise failures. Uh, so replaced at 10 years, regardless, marketing appears synthetic rigging will have more visible failure warning and possibly much longer life. What's your comments on that? Yeah, look, possible. It's too early to know, to be honest. It, the, the product hasn't been out in high volume. Yeah, it, it, it's coming. There's more and more of it. But I just, yeah, I don't know how it's going to stand up to the sun. So I honestly, I, I, I can't be honest and say, yeah, it's going to last longer. or No, it's not. You will see fraying, but you also see ropes furring up very quickly, particularly when they're loaded, that sort of thing. So... Look, it may turn out to be like that, but I, I don't know. I believe it's too early to make that call yet. Mm. Uh, we've got a question here from Patrick with the GBE28. Dolphin Striker has a normal single swage. Is that good enough? It's getting very specific. but um... Um, If we're talking about just a, a standard swage on the end, then, um, yeah, no... Uh, uh, Look, all of these things generally, it, it all depends on the initial design work that's gone into it. So they're very difficult to, to answer honestly without knowing a bit more of the background to it. But on, on our boats, for example, on our little race boats, we have a, a single cable with a swage toggle at one end and a swage turnbuckle at the other end. So they're just crimped onto the wire. Um, and yet that's fine. There's no issues with that at all. Okay. Got a question here from Greg. Uh, how much extra strength is gained from baby stays? Why use them and what rig height? I guess we covered a little bit of that before. Uh, yeah. Look, it's um, it comes down to the various load cases that we look at for the rig. So a baby stay is going to do very little for you when you're in you know, full main and full head. So the only thing it's really going to do is be a a pain in the bum because it's in the middle of the four stay on the mast and you know you get attack around at those sorts of things. Um, when it when it really does offer the support that we want is when you start reefing. So when the the head of your mainsail starts to drop down the mast, so you're not getting that bending moment from the top of the mast, the baby stay essentially helps support the middle of the mast from inversion because the mainsail. So as you reef down, the mainsail is trying to pull the mast backwards wherever the head sits. So if that starts to come down under the hound, it's pulling backwards, you're working against your diamonds only. So if you put a baby stay up there, it just gives that a lot more support. Um, as I say, the, the further down the reef comes to that, the more support it's going to give you. In full main, it does nearly nothing. Yeah, okay. Got a question here from Mark. G'day, Mark, one of our cruising uh, customers out there doing it. Um, is, is it a problem that bungee cords between the inner and main cap shrouds could be hiding a loose rig and inspection when sailing with bungee removed? Would that be a good idea? Um, yeah, look, it, it could certainly mask how loose the rig could be. Yes, for sure, because it's going to pull a lot of the slack out. So um, it's something that, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to pop it off every now and then and just have a look at it. You know, when you're in sort of, we sort of recommend 12 to 15 knots as a nice nice time to look at the tension in your rig. You know, 20 knots is generally starting to get to 
reefing sort of stages for most of these boats. So you're going to start seeing all sorts of weird things and your mainsail will probably not be sheeted how it would. So, you know, do it in a little bit less breeze, in a, not in a stupid seaway. And yeah, it would certainly not hurt to take a bungee off and check it. And also look around where the bungee is sitting on the stay. Make sure there's no trapping of moisture or anything weird going on there. Yeah, excellent. Uh, another question here from Paul. When replacing standing rigging, do you normally replace everything, being uh, from chain plate to mast? Uh, or is it reused the toggles, pins, turnbuckles, uh, SCA lock ends, etc. Um, look, for us, we always try and push our client to change all the fittings. <clears throat> um, not chain plates, if that was included. Chain plates would stay, obviously, unless, you know, we, we kind of stop basically at the bottom of the rigging fitting. Um, we do recommend turnbuckles get replaced, and a lot of that's coming from our manufacturers. Um, we do recommend eyes and toggles at the top, T-balls, um, where we sort of cross over is mass tangs themselves. We generally have a conversation with the client as we're stripping it to see what we see. Um, I would say we, we don't replace very many mass tangs um, simply because, again, they're, they're built so much bigger and stronger than the rest of the fittings. Um, but, yeah, definitely all the wire and associated fittings, yes. Stay locks, much the same. There used to be a fairly popular belief that stay locks would save you money long term because you could just, you know, take the stay lock off and put a new piece of wire in every 10 years. Now, my understanding, and I, I would need to clarify because I haven't heard it for a while, but is that stay lock recommend replacing the fittings after 10 years as well. He's also added here visual MDT testing. Um. Yeah, well, we, we do a little bit of that. Again, it depends on what our client's looking for and, you know, what stage of the life the rig is. Um, you know, we do dye testing. Obviously, a lot of what we do on, on our rig inspections themselves are just visual. Um, I just want to explain what NDT testing is. Non-destructive testing. Right. So we... Um, we don't do a huge amount of it on our standard stainless range. We do it on some of the fittings like that, that turnbuckle where we saw that crack in it. If that was something that we didn't really know, we could do a die check on that. Um, we actually don't do it. We bring people in to do it because it's, you know, we like to, we like to sort of get people who are specialists in their field. Now we can do it, but, it's not what we do day in, day out. And to be honest, we've got enough work on that we don't really want to try and, you know, do that sort of thing. So we get people in if we need to do that. We do it on solid rod a lot. That's when it is done. Um, but, yeah, not not so much on, on all of the stuff that we're dealing with here. Again, at 10 years, we're replacing stuff. It's not very often in that time that we will see something and need to do a test on it. You know, it's generally we will see a, a failure if we've got something that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, sure. Um, another question here from Matthew. Um, as a short-handed sailor, what are some of the options for safely getting up the mast if you don't have a second set of hands mm. around? It's a tough one. <laughs> you need to talk to the French about that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, look, I, I don't really know. We've used various sort of climbing things in the past. Um and I can't remember the names of them, but th there is products out there, but we don't have them because for our workplace health and safety and insurance, we, we don't have to deal with that and we can't. We just, the way that we work, because of because it's a commercial operation, we don't deal with it. Um, but yeah, look, sorry, I'm not much help on that one. I know there is products out there, but I, I don't know what they are. And I, I'd be talking to the French solo guys. They're, they're the kings of that world. Mm. Mm. And any thoughts on boom uh, preventers or brakes? Does that have any impact at all? On in what way? Sorry. Well, using a, a boom preventer, um, I guess, is going to stop some whiplash. Is, you, you see any negative um, issues with having a, a boom preventer or brake? Not really, no. The only thing it does do is obviously if you go into an accidental drive with a boom brake, for example, it does load that point of the boom, but... As long as it's, you know, boom brakes are designed so that they slow that motion. They don't stop it. <clears throat> so from that point of view, um, no, no real issues with them. 
on multis, generally they're not running that square or they have a preventer from the end of the boom because the boats are so much wider. You know, mm. And that's, yeah, probably, that's, that's a pretty good system, I think, for multis. Seems to work quite well. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, listen, we've run over time there a little bit. So, um, mate, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing all of that knowledge with us today. And um, I'm sure if people want to get uh, in touch with you, Google all yacht spas and, uh, and, and drop you a line. And obviously, uh, you're, you're based here in Brisbane. So anyone around the, the Brisbane Gold Coast area, you can both service and, and replace rigs for, no doubt. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. It's um, that hour went a, a lot quicker than I expected. It being that I'm new to all of this, it's uh, it was good. So we're, we're all hand, held my mate. hand through this it is, well. Thank you. This is, this is the modern way. Yeah. So, uh, and what's, yeah, yeah, what's on yeah. what's on no, your list look, now? I hope. Oh, sailing wise. Yeah. What's um. Look, I, I I don't do a huge amount of sailing locally now. I I I have bought into another boat locally which is one of the extreme 40s we've got a few of those going up here so we'll do a little bit of local sailing on that um, until the world opens up again so i sail with a with a, a team up overseas that's based in thailand um, and the owner of that program he and i are, are partners in it he's the majority owner i'm just a you know sort of here to assist but um We'll be campaigning that when when we're allowed to, when when the borders open up again and some events become available. So up until then, we'll just I'll just be doing local stuff and basically spending time with the family when I can. That's been the uh, another really great thing that's come of COVID is it's sort of you know given me a lot more family time than I've had. So that's uh, I've appreciated that. Yeah, fantastic. All right, mate. Well, again, thank you very much, and uh, hope to get up there someday. Uh, Hope maybe Christmas if we're lucky. But I don't know. When we're, whenever we're allowed. In the meantime, we're going to go sailing. But um, uh, and and for any of those watching, thanks everyone for showing up today. Great uh, great crowd today. Um, if you want to see the replay, we will be sending a, a replay out to those who registered on um, uh, through the webinar. Uh, but also full replay on a YouTube channel, Multi Old Central's uh, sabbaticals. So just dump into jump into the, uh, the the replays and they've got the full so I think it's 20 different episodes we've got there now on these different subjects uh, next week we've got a really interesting topic we're going to Lord Howe Island and as a destination uh, topic and we're going to have Peter Adams uh, tell us all about Lord Howe so if you're interested in uh, in cruising to uh, one of the World Heritage uh, sites. That's uh, that's on the on the subject for next Friday at twelve noon again. So uh, anyway, thanks, Joel. Thank you. you thanks, soon. everybody. All right.